Hi, and welcome to the Road to Sustainability show. Today, I'm really excited to share with you my discussion with the amazing Dr. Lobna Karui. Lobna is an artificial intelligence trust builder and results oriented with more than two decades experience building AI products for more than 15 million users and customers. She is one of the thousand AI experts in the world who signed autonomous weapons, an open letter with Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk. She is a Google-recognized expert about disruption, empathy, and trust. As a digital transformer, she has been working with thousands of business game changers and executives in banking, telecommunication, hosting, luxury, retail, automotive, and health. According to her successful track record of driving cost-effective and scalable AI strategies, she was invited as a contributor at Forbes and the MIT, and as a speaker at Harvard University, Stanford, World Economic Forum, Amazon, Bloomberg. Dr. Karui was graduate from Central Superlake and Yale. She is involved in multiple experts groups from the World Economic Forum, the Women Forum, Economic European Commission to design the future of work and education with ethics in the fourth industrial revolution. Hi, Lobna. Hi, Yael. How are you? I'm good, and you? I'm fantastic. Uh, I would like to thank you so much for uh, accepting my invitation and thank you very much for uh, being with us and sharing your experience. Thank you for having me in this episode about sustainability and women. Would you like to tell us a bit about your background? Sure. So uh, I came from an academic background as a PhD in, in computer science uh, in France, at, in Super Lake in the field of artificial intelligence. And I did my research uh, in the specific area of web semantics uh, by defining machine learning algorithms to extract and understand knowledge uh, from the web. Uh, and, but in the meantime, I was associate professor in uh, Polytechnic and uh, University of Sorbonne uh, for a few years. Uh, this is uh, my first experience in academic uh, part. Then despite my passion for AI researches and all you know, the travel and publication and this stuff, exciting stuff. I was very curious about um, how can we apply such powerful science and, and technology, by the way, for businesses. And this has let me jump on the corporate world. We are talking about the years around 2006 and 2008. And as you remember, at that time, AI was not that much uh, developed in company, right? Absolutely. Uh, in France, but also in all the world. So it was inexistent. Sense, yeah, yeah. At that time, like you, uh, for me, for instance, I start. Work, I, 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 I jumped with the expectation to work right away on AI, mm. but it's not the case. So I, I found myself working in IT transformation roadmaps uh, with a very specific area of cost-driven focus and in the telecommunication industry. So it was, a, it was a boom in a way, but I almost arrived in years where um, you remember, the, the, if, if you remember at that time, uh, the traditional uh, corporates in telecommunication was disrupted by a new actor, uh, name it Free. And I remember pretty well that time, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, such disruption pushed big corporates to review uh, um, their pricing policy, but also uh, massively their yes. investment in, in, the, in their projects. So leading IT transformation uh, programs with, you know, a lot of components from BI, uh, CRMs, uh, financial systems, e-commerce platform as well, mm. was not that, uh, let me observe that um, data was not that much exploited. Yeah. And I find my background in AI uh, pro helping me in the way to propose new projects uh, to start implementing machine learning algorithms in order to uh, better extract insight from data. Mm. And this is how I started my, my journey in the corporate world uh, at that time. Now, I, am, I will not talk about all my, uh, my journey, you know, it's up and down <laughs> many years uh, to the case now. But if you focus uh, on the last decade of my professional, professional journey, my main roles was mainly about leading engineering teams to develop AI capacity and accelerating uh, what we call today digital transformation uh, by redesigning business processes and automating them. Um, just a little bit, a snapshot of some of my experience, not all of them. 
But for instance, at LVMH, uh, one of the great experience um, with great people at, uh, in, in this industry, my role was business growth oriented. Mm. Uh, and, and my team and I uh, was uh, working in the very specific area of small data uh, to detect weak signals. Uh, and just for the audience to know that weak signals can be, in some cases, a new opportunity for the business. And at that time, we was able to, with other teams for sure, to, 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 to provide a potential increase of revenue by 8% in, in, in the highest rate for sure. Yeah, yeah. So this is one of the experience. Uh, another one, it's, uh, it's completely different. And uh, you will see it was a Dell 5 power train in the United States, in Detroit. Uh, and I took an executive position to initiate a data factory uh, with the main target, and it's a little bit strange for some of the audience, I guess, to optimize cost production in factory. So for me, who was, who was not working in factory, it was a lot of learning experience, mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, working with um, people, technicians, and, you know, uh, managers in this area. But uh, we, we came up by a new way to exploit data in a way to rationalize systems. Mm and offers uh, to our business teams a 360 view of all their activity to optimize their business approach uh, according to, uh, to, to, to the market for sure. And we demonstrate at that time the cost reduction by 21 persons in, in the first three years, which is amazing, at least from a cost perspective, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, now, Let's say, as, as you know, uh, Yael, moving between different uh, company, industry and, and country is, is quite challenging. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, keep us, and we, we start talking about this right before the podcast, it keep us flexible, adaptable in a sense that we are uh, developing this growth mindset and trying to, you know, make our, make the best that we can do and learn from people around us in order to flip this issue in opportunity and, and to bring this performance to, 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 to the corporate world and to the business for sure. But, but this, is, uh, this is my mindset, let's say. Within the same mindset, a few years back, I found myself jumping on a new role as AI business director via Google and I stepped back. And the challenge was because I stepped back from the AI development uh, side to join the business side mm. uh, and for me it was like uh, a big challenge uh, and but if we keep uh, just in mind what I appreciate the most in such mission current mission is meeting wide range of customers and and I know that you you are working in this in, in similar area right yes. uh, to help them accelerate um, their digital transformation uh, in two axes mainly. The first axe is trying to scaling, helping them scaling uh, their technology products. And the second axe is defining disruptive use cases. Yes. Uh, and those use cases are magic. You know why? Because sometimes uh, it even open new markets uh, for Absolutely. them. And, and you know, you, when you see this, you feel the, the, the common excitement, you know, that you can uh, let uh, your customer gain a competitive advantage uh, in, in a, a such hard time of uh, business time, right? Yes. Uh, yes. But anyway, uh, this is in general a, a, like a snapshot of some of my experience. Now, what people don't know about me is that I always was involved in philanthropy from the time I was student and it started very early. Uh, at that time, I was working more on uh, helping children have a decent lives with the right education uh, needs. Uh, and last year, I was appointed as um, uh, the president of AI Exponential Thinker to scale wow. our positive impact uh, as NGO. Uh, so without... Congratulations. Let's say we are a small NGO, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea is not small or big. The idea is what we are expecting to do as a mission for this world. And our mission is to educate and empower young people, but also global citizens about uh, trust technology and AI opportunity. So within this role in philanthropy, as you remarked, I found a way uh, to, to use my professional experience, combine it to my passion to AI, uh, to serve people in this time of uncertainty, mm. but mainly to help them 
see the positive and bright side of the future that hopefully uh, come back after COVID-19 and we will see it uh, soon. So let's say my journey, uh, Yael, was uh, overwhelming, quite challenging, mm -hmm. a lot of ups and downs, right? Not linear for sure. And giving back to the society is the most rewarding part of it. Well, first of all, congratulations for such a journey. I mean, it's impressive, I have to say. Uh, I'm right now discovering another aspect, you know, of uh, who is behind that uh, LinkedIn profile. So thank you for sharing and thank you for sharing. I mean, your experience, it's it's tremendous. Congratulations. Uh, and, and, you, and I'm pretty sure that you're going to tell me that it's not, uh, it's just the beginning, right? <laughs> I will tell you more that it's uh, by having a lot of support yeah. and uh, a lot of learning experience from people uh, that surround you, you, you can uh, follow your path, right? And, and, and by the way, help the others as well to follow their path. So we cannot achieve anything in this world by our, only ourselves, right? Absolutely. That's right. And uh, that's one of the main pillars of my uh, review actually on that's on LinkedIn that we must lead by um, multidisciplinary teams and obviously get the support from stakeholders and the surrounding ecosystems otherwise we cannot survive in this world um, how would you describe the current state actually Fantastic question. <laughs> a very large one, right? Uh, frankly, the current global states like uh, seems better than 2020 in the sense of we are seeing a vaccine administrated to all people and mm. uh, in many countries and, and regions of the world. And in Seattle, for instance, we are uh, mainly encouraged to get the vaccine, which is, which is a big progress for everyone and especially for our safety, right? Um, now I think people are getting tired, even me, right? Being in such uncertainty for more than a year, it's tough for yes. people. Uh, from a general perspective, I would say that I perceive a sort of anxiety and depression, yes. uh, particularly for young people uh, regarding the lockdown in some region, some country, you know, it's something not clear and also about the future. Uh, and to me, as I keep saying, uh, I'm trying to work on it as well, uh, to, be, uh, to be very transparent, uh, to train our brain. I am always saying we need to train our brain to find the positive side of everything that happens in our life, right? And COVID-19 is a concrete example to practice and be more supportive to others who are in need. So this, this, it was not predicted. And we, we, we need to, to, to live with it and, and, and soon it will, it will move. So it, it will finish hopefully, so which, which, is, which is great. But you know, uh, yeah, it's very important to, to gather information from media and social platforms. And we just talked about, about this before, but what makes sense, it's, it's being in contact with people uh, locally and observe the reality. And, yeah. and having this experience, a recent experience in an NGO, non-profit organization with contributors in all continents, um, I keep receiving news about local situations, you know, and, and this uncertainty that is not the same in all the world, and it's not helping people feeling safe and perceive a positive future. So we try to keep uh, sending signs about this positive future, right? But people are seeing other things and we need to, to push this positive mindset, right? Uh, but now at the same time, I would say that the digital world and technology were a miracle solution for us, right? For whether it's for working remotely, uh, but Absolutely. also keeping contacts between each other yeah. uh, and maintaining uh, education for mm. our young generation, which is very important. Uh, for, for, for a mom, I know what is the importance of education, right? <laughs> <laughs> so for, for, from a business perspective, uh, COVID-19 accelerates the digital transformation of most biggest corporate com corporates and working remotely will be even the way to work for many verticals, even after COVID-19. So um, another aspect is traveling for business yeah. and we, uh, it's very important to travel uh, at least for business. Uh, but also for leisure, right? <laughs> uh, for vacation. But 
but last year uh, we shift 100 online which is not bad for perspective of cost <laughs> but in this space uh, to be to be very transparent we need the real contact with customers yes it, it's much better when it comes especially to start a relationship uh, with a customer and, and build the trust you know it, it's not easy um, at the beginning when you start a relationship with the customer then having the face-to-face the on-site visits those aspects is very important mm. uh, to, to be closer to the business yes. and also closer to the needs that they have now from a technology perspective i think that um, this time i help in the rapid expansion of technology uh, this is a positive side and we have seen a rapid growth of many startups uh, with a huge investment and this is a sign also of a lot of opportunity uh, in, in the market um, now with education uh, topic is something that uh, I'm really involved with on, so I will talk about as well. So from an education perspective, I feel that online classes is not the way to educate our children and your people. Mm. And I, I'm, I'm very frank, I, I would be very, talk very frankly in this part, yeah, yeah. Uh, because we did a lot, we did at least three surveys from uh, April 2020 till now. Uh, and we try to uh, to ask the questions to young people, but also to parents, uh, and even to uh, and especially to teacher as well. And it's really hard uh, to to educate young people uh, online by online classes. And in some country, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, there is a lack of strong infrastructure. And we observe this in some country in Africa and in, in Asia as well. And millions of kids were not able to follow their courses. And this is, and even in the United States and some, in some places, uh, there's a lot of reports that show that in some places, some, some villages, some cities, some kind of places, uh, there's a lack of um, following the courses for, for kids. And I'm really wondering that maybe it can be a risk for the future to create more literacy gaps so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm really aware about the education future and it's very important to, to say that I think that we need to find another way but not online way for young people, especially for young, for children and young people. Things are getting better uh, from a health perspective. Uh, being safe is essential and people need to be uh, safe also mentally. Uh, we, we, we listen less about mentally but yeah. we need to say that um, Digital universe are a lot of positive aspects, yeah. but have some dark side. Mm. And I think regulating the digital world and defining policy and laws to rebuild trust is crucial today. Mm. Um, another aspect that I already started talking about is preparing the young generation for the future is also important and the education system should hopefully be reshaped to be adapted to the future of work. Well, I cannot agree more. Um, especially um, being surrounded, you know, by teens and uh, and 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 young kids all the time. Uh, I see, you know, the change coming up from the crisis actually, and the impact of the environment that is brutally uh, changing. Um, and actually, now that we're almost out of the of the crisis, maybe the most impacted population are the ones that uh, got forgotten by society, especially the students. And and on that point, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very into research, very into academics, very into education as you. And back to our conversation from the pre-recording, um, we mentioned that somehow, you know, these changes have uh, a huge impact, but also have to be embraced by the young generation. But without the tools, without uh, the frameworks, without the oh. environment that we can, we have to, as parents, as um, teachers, as uh, uh, bosses, whatever, uh, as leaders, um, down the road, if they don't have the tools to manage um, and to, first of all, to learn from, and to get their own experience, we're gonna have more and more difficulties to face the next challenges and to address properly the challenges. And and one of the challenges that I see um, post-crisis 
uh, is actually about diversity and inclusion. And that's specifically why I, I, I'm trying, you know, during this podcast and uh, from the very first day when I started writing on these reviews, um, it's about, you know, trying to understand how people behaved and how people managed during the crisis and how actually, what is the experience? What are the, the, the outcomes? What are the tools that you got from this crisis, out of this crisis? And how do you see, I mean, the next steps on your side? You, you know, the crisis uh, was tough uh, in, in the, at the beginning. Uh, I would say it like everyone in the world, uh, especially between February to April, it depends on your location in the world. For mm. me, it was at that time, around this period. And regarding this uncertainty and power of such big pandemic, my, my main concern at that time was, like everyone, it will, it's more about healthy, uh, health safety, uh, whether for my family or also for my collaborators um, in, in different places of the mm. world. And uh, so it, it's, it's like everyone, right? Yeah. Um, now for my activity as for my business part of work, uh, traveling is, is, is mainly uh, uh, essential in my work, but it was quite challenging to change such agenda of six months of visit on sites, mm. whether in United States or outside in very rapid way. But the only positive thing is that uh, working remotely is not new mm. for me, it's to us, at least as a team. So we was able to very to, to, to try to take a little bit of time <laughs> and, 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 and to, to uh, provide a sort of insurance to our customers and, and try to uh, propose the right alternatives <laughs> uh, within the right uh, timeline as well. <laughs> Uh, and and this is uh, the part of work, but the part of AI exponential thinker um, was more challenging to, to me because on January 2020 we was expecting to uh, to launch more than 20 local events during the year, wow. and we was lucky at the beginning to uh, to start very quick because since we, we we think that we need to like in our strategy, uh, 2020 was the year of scalability, right? So we didn't expect that COVID-19 will come. So we, we expect to have those events according uh, additionally to our programs and, yeah. and webinars. Uh, so we did many from Silicon Valley to Kenya in the first three, four months. But when, when, when things come from February to, to April, mm. it depends on the place of the world, it was really tough for mm. the management team to, to try to find, you know, to reassure our com com contributors, yeah. you know, and supporters, our sponsors, you know, and all the staff around the uh, non-profit organization. But we did it uh, and we reduced uh, the number of events uh, and then we, we come back with the webinars. Mm -hmm. And in June 2020, we launched the Unique AI Channel of Trust, uh, which is a series of podcasts in, in order to... Uh, to be more close to our audience, to reach more audience for sure, and to avoid to provide this material to our partners. Yeah. No matter where they are, we can provide to them these materials to reach more people, uh, and 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 hopefully, uh, according to our strategy, we are expected to reach one million people according to twenty twenty five. Hopefully, mm -hmm. uh, we will see. Right? <laughs> we don't know. We will see. Let's say uh, optimistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we are seeing that there is a lot of people who are rich and it's great. Um, there is a lot of interaction, a lot of questions come uh, like uh, uh, coming to the surface in order for our guests, for our uh, programs, whatever. Uh, but but again, we are at the beginning, so so we will see. Now, from for startups uh, where I'm in the board or advisor, I thought that it was really a, a hard time. Uh, with less opportunity for the first months and, and being supportive um, by your shaping a sort of contextual risk mm. plans for them mm -hmm. was beneficial. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, as you said, we are optimists. Uh, we, see, we are seeing much more uh, opportunity in the market and, and this, is, uh, this is a good sign uh, for, 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 for the coming months. Um, 
Now another aspect, as you know, as speakers, I miss our conference, right? Mm -hmm. And the meetups and uh, meeting people face to face. Um, and even I remember one of my last uh, last uh, face to face speaking opportunity. Uh, it was exactly on February twenty twenty at Amazon uh, in Seattle, and after that, I was invited in another conference in Washington uh, about public sector and digital transformation. But unfortunately. Uh, lockdown come <laughs> and we was uh, invited to do it virtually so less opportunity to you know to to meet the people face to face and now I'm, I'm still missing mm -hmm. so hopefully now soon things will come back right hopefully and yeah we'll see each other and uh, visit each other as before uh, I, we was uh, but another aspect which is amazing so, like we was lucky for our event in new york mm. uh, it was in new york um, university and it was just three days before the lockdown in new york we didn't expect at, at that time because even new york at that time they didn't have um like insight that probably they, it will be a, a lockdown soon so even us we didn't uh, define the plan b and was really lucky to have this great audience at the time in New York University a few days before. But let's say that this first month of pandemic in 2020 were tough mentally for everyone and for me as well as a, as a family member, but as a collaborator. Of course. And keeping connected uh, to each other uh, via virtual coffee, we, we, we was inventive, right? Yeah. So we create virtual coffee together as we, we did define distance and walks uh, with my colleagues and partners. So we try to, to provide other aspects in order to keep connected, right? Mm. And at the end of the day, uh, we are human. And the most important we thing are. is our head. Definitely. You mentioned earlier um, missing traveling, which is very common you know to many guests that i have actually you know as i mentioned to you earlier you know my head is in california all day long and you know yeah. i speak with new york london um as earlier today and we're in partnership with some academies in india i think that the dimension of covid that br mostly brought us to the fact that we can interact without necessary traveling but we really need human interaction and that's the natural path that um, we're talking about and I feel that most of my um, first of all most of my uh, my guests especially women and especially uh, the listeners um, are just about you know to 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 be to be fair and to be transparent we really need this human interaction and without doing it, it's somehow uh, removing the natural path as human being, and especially again as women, to uh, express ourselves in a proper way, to be fully transparent, to be fully honest, to be to show gratitude, to engage, and that's something that you know maybe is gonna impact the evolution in the tech industry uh, on the women's side. That can cause obviously new biases um, and, and can impact improperly full communities of techies. And that's a, that's a concern that I'm, I'm raising. And that leads me to, you know, to, the, to the next question about you know, the fact that today we have only 23% of women uh, in the tech industry for the past 25 years, actually. I think that you know, um, many corporations have um, a responsibility in that. And what, what's your take? You know, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, one of the, the, the statements that attract my attention in, in, in Gates Foundation in Seattle is uh, what they call trust data. And to me, since I work, in, as you know, in, on data on a daily basis for decades, I would say trust data, yes, but trust data to change reality. Mm. Uh, what I mean by this is use data to guide your actions for positive impact. So today, 23% of executive roles by women, held by women, seems not a reality that conjointly women and men can accept. Uh, and I'm saying women and men. Uh, you I know, agree. when you have the only woman in an executive committee or board, it's not sufficient to raise your voice 
and in some cases even to change the decisions yeah and in the same time having more women or balance without listening to their voices is not a solution mm. so from a general perspective i'm seeing a progress in this space and many institutions are working a different way uh, whether on call to actions or programs for mentoring to support women uh, coachings also in order to help them um, gaining more exposure more confidence and and uh, jump on those leadership positions but uh, at the same time it's not enough yeah right it's not enough uh, for instance like even ai exponential thinker we have a a chapter for a, for women, especially for girls and young women. And we are a partner of Women Forum Economic and mm. we are part of the call to actions uh, for J20 and G7 for inclusive AI and women in AI. Uh, and it's not only in the technical aspect, but also in leadership aspects. So both of them. Excellent. And I think we need more innovative solution today mm. to change the reality and more laws to open the path of women uh, to acquire these decision-making positions, it, it, it's not that much easy uh, to them as well, and to me, to be, and to all of us, right, as women. I will not address. You know, the the, the topic is very large, mm -hmm. uh, and it's quite challenging. And we often uh, address it, uh, uh, at least in workshops uh, in AI exponential thinking with girls and women, and it's always confusing yes. because they cannot accept those statistics, you know, especially young girls and uh, girls and young women, they cannot accept to, to know that they need to wait until 100-ish uh, years to, uh, to uh, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to achieve yes. this equality and, you know, and whatever. Mm. But I will answer to the question in a very specific context, Yael, regarding technology building and digital transformation, which yeah. is the area where we are uh, working right yeah, absolutely. Uh, so in this particular area from my perspective um, I think that accelerated digital transformation and creating new solutions uh, we cannot do it without women without diversity without absolutely. inclusion um, and, and we need women also in, in the decision making position not mm -hmm. as a technical uh, leader but also as someone who can uh, push and change the decision as well uh, in a collaborative way for sure. Uh, another aspect which is very important is for AI ethics and trust technology. We have one of uh, our podcasts named it the AI Deal of Trust, uh, where we invite uh, AI experts but also AI enthusiasts. And we need more women in governance to build the balance um, that can secure in a way a trusted uh, decision making process. Yeah. Uh, we talk about diversity before uh, we start the podcast and it's something very important and we need to uh, make more effort yes. in order to achieve it today, right? Uh, now, from my own perspective, I, I, I would say that we need more coaching support for mm -hmm. women as well uh, to help them believe on their potential and valorize uh, their assets and competences uh, and, and jump on those decision makers' position. And I'm repeating because... We need to say to women that they can have those positions, right? Uh, and especially for young women, uh, we need to help them to achieve uh, very early such positions and not at the end of your career, <laughs> what generally we achieve at some part of the mm -hmm. end of career. I am saying that we need to push the girls to be very ambitious and to stand up to those positions very early in their career. I would add that it's not easy for a woman um, to be around uh, such table of governance, to be honest, and, and defend her voice. Uh, there's many stories in my mind, whether it's more personal ones, but also about other CEO and executives, females, uh, leaders. And, and the only thing that we keep saying together is that it's mostly about believing on yourself. And, and looking for those coaching, mentoring opportunity, empowering programs, and, and, and supporters that can help you in, in such process. And as we said also before, it's very important to ask for the help, ask for the support, ask for the sponsorship. It's very important to look after those opportunities 
Uh, now, if we go personally in my part of life, as someone's raised by a strong, very strong woman, mom, and empowering a father for his daughter, uh, we, we are four at family, right? In our mm. family, we are two boys, two girls. But my father was much more empowering us as women than empowering the boys, which is something uh, probably exists in my, in my personality. So I feel very comfortable uh, when it comes to work with male collaborators and, and, and managers. And I feel even supported in many, in many uh, parts of my experience, which is, which is something I'm so grateful for it. Um, now, we, we talk about supporting, empowering, right? Another part which is very important yeah, is education. Yes. Uh, I, I think we, women can't change the state, this state by themselves. Uh, they need male support everywhere, whether as a personal partner in your family, but also as a collaborator uh, in your workplace. And if we think about um, uh, education, I think we need to push more programs uh, uh, in different stages. Yeah, whether I agree. it's for children, for youth people, to to let them work together, you know, and understand that it's very important to be supportive in both sides, mm. women for men, men for women, you know, uh, and all minority in, in this world, we need to be supportive and education is one of the main points that we need to work on it as well. In your profile, you speak about empowerment and how would you describe today the movement um, and how personally do you see it? Uh, what are the things that are required in such an environment? Advice would you give to young women? Uh, what should they learn? Um, and how would you drive them, you know, towards the crisis and post-crisis, um, especially in terms of education? Uh, I would say, like, let's think about it from an opportunity perspective. Uh, generally, people don't talk about this part, and I think that it's very important to say to young girls uh, and women, the highest number of job opportunity in, in 2025 will be in STEM field and particularly in technology and engineering fields. So from this perspective, girls and young women uh, in a way should acquire digital skills, whether mm. it's less technical, like a UX designer, like a project manager, digital project manager, product owner, but also technical aspects like you know, more software engineer, data engineer, and data scientist, and IT engineer, those aspects and AI researchers. Uh, but the world, like, there is another set of skills that we, we start, like, people uh, need to understand that those are the skills of the futures uh, that I was announced by the World Economic Forum uh, last year. It's much more about cognitive flexibility, adaptability, empathy, problem solving, uh, and, and curiosity. And I think these skills are essential for jobs in the universe of digital. But unfortunately, uh, we start talking about education. Um, our current education system in the world is not yet really uh, preparing the students to acquire those new skills of the future. And it's in this skills, these skills are like a mask. You need to work on it in a daily basis to uh, maintain it, to develop it, right? And it's not something that when you acquire it, it's done. You need to work on it all the time. So that maybe that's why education system didn't still now mm -hmm. work on it. But hopefully, yeah. at least in AI exponential thinker, we are working on workshops in order to um, create this critical thinking uh, mindset and push the creativity and curiosity of our members uh, to, to work, to, to jump and to gain those new opportunity. So this is few a few advices like uh, for for young girls uh, and I was invited like when I was in France a long time ago uh, in the, to talk to young girls teenagers uh, and to try to you know to talk about my experience but mainly about what they answer their questions and and I, I feel like this anxiety a lot of girls told me that. Um, Technical uh, domains are very complex, and it's not for me, all right? So at that time, I find myself, it was a, a, a spontaneous question. So I, would, I find myself at that time taking an example of from their complete life and saying that, what if you are creating the application that you are enjoying today? Like, what, 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 where you are 
spending more time using Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, those applications that are making our lives easier, right? So what if tomorrow you are the ones who are collaborating to create this application or another a, a version of this application or a new one, completely new one that help people massively in the world live a better life. Uh, and if you feel just this uh, rewarding feeling, you will understand that it's, it's worthy to, to have these complex times of learning and to jump on those opportunity, exceptional one in the future. So think about from a perspective of opportunity more than a complex domain or area because it's not only about complexity, it's more about learning. And I would add that it's important to appreciate what you will do as a job yeah. and gaining confidence um, will help you wherever you are and whatever job you do. Uh, and the last piece of advice will be, be know yourself mm -hmm. and dream mm -hmm. big, but start small. Exactly. Uh, to, to, to follow your path. This yeah. is the most important thing, I think. How, what is required today to get a seat at the table as a woman? I think, um, you know, they, there's a lot of aspects. But, but if I can summarize a little bit, um, for me, it's the shape of this education, like the education system should help people change their mindset mm -hmm. uh, in a way that will help women and minority find their, their safe environment. This is something very important. Yes. Um, another part that we already start talking about, it's empowering. Yeah. Uh, we need those programs of empowerment, um, uh, whether it's mentoring or coaching, it depends. Um, it, in some cases you cannot, if you are asking for a mentoring opportunity and you will not find, it, it's happened sometimes, mm. uh, go and ask for coaching. It's very important to have the coach. They work differently for sure, but they are, their approaches are complementary. And I think that the mentoring is much more about sharing experience and the coaching is working on your strength and or your, your ability to do things, which is completely different. Mm -hmm. And both of them are very important for women today. For instance, in AI Exponential Thinker, we propose programs for girls. Uh, and within this program uh, of empowerment, um, we was focusing on digital skills, for sure, and technical uh, pro modules. But also, we added uh, modules of leadership, communication, and exposure. Uh, and we also added mentoring for male, which is Excellent. completely new. Excellent. Generally, uh, we have only women between each other, and for uh, for my case, it was a remark from one of my ex uh, colleagues who moved to Apple, and he told me, "Why in this program you are uh, only uh, having uh, women mentors?" Like I was, I was like, "Okay," but I understand from the young girls that they are more comfortable when there is uh, more. Uh, a, a female environment, at least in the first steps. So he told me, I can understand that in the first steps you need to be uh, in a woman, in a safe woman, a female environment. But the final environment in the workplace is men and women. Exactly. So I think that you should, with the, the board, change a little bit your programs to invite male mentors in order mm -hmm. to help really those girls seeing the reality yes. and being comfortable in such reality. And, and to be fair, at the first, when I, I, I proposed it in, um, in the board, they told me, I think we, keep, we need to keep only for girls by women. And when we asked some girls, especially uh, ones who are starting also their career, they appreciate the fact that we invite main, uh, male to the table yes. in order to help them Absolutely. Uh, understand more the real world. Uh, and so we did it like this and, and we invite few members, uh, a few mentors at least, mm -hmm. uh, three mentors in one of our programs that we offer in Jamaica. And it's, it's really nice. But you talk about 23 persons and I will come back to this again. We need to push the girls very early to believe on their self achieve those positions 
I agree. And not to wait until uh, mid career or wherever to, to, to start thinking, yes. okay, now I feel more comfortable. It's like a muscle, you have to work on it in a daily basis. Mm-hmm. And the earliest you start, the better you, are, you will achieve. And generally, it's not the case because we see a lot of movement, you know, when in mid career we start empowering women, you know, in order to have those positions. I would say it's a little bit late. And in AI exponential thinking, we start very early. Girls, they are already on schools. We start saying to them that it's very important if you wish, if you find yourself, like if you want for sure, if you want to go and jump very early in your career, hopefully 30, those positions. Because the tech industry needs those people as well, right? And you talk about diversity and inclusion, and it's very important to have girls and women in those positions of governance very early in their career. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. It's, 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 it's important, and it's if, even more important right now that we're getting uh, out of the crisis and we're going to need, you know, more workforce, more diverse workforce, actually, and multidisciplinary thinking. And that's, that's uh, first of all, congratulations again, you know, for the work that you're, do, you're doing, actually. It's, it's tremendous. I have to, have to applaud you. Um, Lovna, thank you so much for sharing your experience. Um, and, and, I'm, and I can't wait, you know, to know the next step and how we're going to collaborate because I see so much sure. intersections and etc. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Yael, to have uh, for inviting me in this podcast. Thank you for raising voices uh, and especially uh, inspiring young women and women in the world uh, about sustainability, diversity, and the importance of uh, believing on yourself, right? Thank you. Thank you for your leadership. It's so, you're so demonstrative. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank Hi, you very I much, Yael.